Hey guys, look what just came in the mail. I'm Brian and I want to do a video that's going to encompass a couple of different phases. First, I want to unbox this big boy. I want to have a look at him. And then of course we have to assemble the box that comes with it. And then once we finally get to the point where we can have a listen, I want to do a review of my impressions of this in action. So first things first, let's get this box open so we can have a look at it. A little box inside a box actually. For reference, I've been using a couple of 12 inch subwoofers for some time and it's been quite a few years since I've been able to use a 15, so to me, this looks gigantic. Alright, here we are. Let me get this box out of the way. There we are, there's Big Papa. This is a Dayton Audio Ultimax 15. All right, we've got the box that the pieces for the box came in, unpacked. I've taken a few minutes to get sorted through all of the different pieces available. We've pretty much got what's gonna end up being the back of the box that from everything I've seen is what we built up from, ending with putting the front on as the top. And pretty much it comes with a couple of braces, starting with this one that we're gonna put right where it fits in this middle there, in there, put a cross section brace across there, and then just start attaching the sides up on top of that, applying wood glue every turn. Following the recommendations of many DIYers that have come before me, and I'm gonna be using Type Bond too. The downer that of course comes with building a box the wood glue instead of screws is we have to wait 24 hours after we finish it before we can play with this, but I think it's going to end up being a more attractive box with all the screws and everything in it. So, Alright, so let's go ahead and get started with some of this glue. Tips I've gotten from others who have done this before are that if there's not excessive glue spilling out the sides, you haven't used enough glue, so that's going to be the aim here is to really make sure that we're going liberal with the glue. If you saw that monster sub earlier, we can assume what it can do. And what we definitely don't want is to get this box together, but it's not quite solid enough for all the vibration that Big 15 is going to have. So definitely want all of these points as strong as we can. This is going to be a major support point on the inside, so let's get it kind of crazy with that, just to make sure. That's a good measure because I'll be doing this throughout the process anytime we have a seam. I always like to fill them all in. Alright, that part in the middle I'm going to leave alone because I want it to put down all of these cracks. I did a quick hold up earlier and it does seem that the two major side pieces that the front is going to sit down onto pretty much line up perfectly with this this way and this way. It doesn't seem that it matters which it is in the terms of height here. 
comes pretty flush either way. I'm assuming it doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and do it this way so that the two major side pieces that hold the front are on these sides and then the smaller panels will come in over here once I've gotten those in place. So pretty much as we build this it looks like you pretty much would just run a big line of glue there and then go up this side and it's this support piece that's essentially going to hold this side on while the glue dries. Of course, as you can see on the floor, I do have some large clamps ready for once we get this into place so that things don't dry cock iron off. There seem to be a lot of little seams in here where things weren't perfectly lined up. And it's too late now to really do a whole lot of adjusting. And so the best we can do is just keep applying glue and hope that the glue can basically fill in any minor cracks that we have and keep our finger across from there that that's going to be enough.
This box has two front panels. One of them is slightly bigger on the outside, the square part, than the other one. And it's the part, as you can see in the recess here, that you would actually mount the woofer onto and bolt it in. And this piece is meant to go behind it as a reinforcer. And this is the piece that actually fits right down into what we've constructed here. So here we go again. So, just to make sure things don't dry or something doesn't fit, while well, we still have any wet glue left, let's go ahead and get that top piece on. Because the final piece that goes over this brace will be a lot easier to get on afterward because that's just going to sit on top. But this piece that we're talking about right now has to adjoin to every other piece that we've done. So we really got to make sure that things line up. And for good measure, let's get up on, come on Blue, stay with me. Let's get up on this wall here, since it is gonna attach there. I just really wanna cover our bases. For the next time I do a project like this, ideally you need a fourth clamp because what I'm having right now is this could go down ever so slightly more than it does, but right now I need those other three clamps. So what I'm going to see if I can do is put something heavy on the top. <clears throat> Okay, I've been letting this part set for about 25 minutes uh, just because I was getting some seams up along the top on all of the sides there without the clamps and I didn't want that to become a problem. But now that it's set at least a little bit, I'm gonna temporarily remove the clamps so that I can apply the glue all around the top, this piece over top of it, and then I'll reapply the clamps. And then at that point, we're gonna be done for today because it's just a matter of waiting 24 hours for that wood glue to do its job. Some folks in DIY forums, I was reading that I came upon while doing some research for this kind of stuff said that you should plan to use an entire bottle of this type on on these projects and they're not wrong. I'm not quite out, but I'm pretty darn close. All right, I think that's gonna do it. I guess let's put on a little bit more since I do have some extra in here to do it. And this is the last piece, so. And it's the front where there's going to be the most push and pull from the woofer. So we definitely want this piece to be strong. Alright, yeah, here we go. I'm going to preemptively get my paper towel ready because we know there's going to be some spill. Pull 
this top the minute I put that clamp on. So hold on while I get ready another clamp as quick as we can here. So yes and no on ultimately if someone were to ask me is it cooler to build a box with glue than screws like i think the finished product looks better if it doesn't have screws on all the sides but there's really something to be said for if you just bolt it aside down that's like fucking on and nothing's gonna shift nothing's gonna happen there would be no clamps if you were doing it that way all right guys i think that's about as good as we're gonna be able to get it right now there might be some more seams to kind of touch up with the glue, but I can't really get at them with all the clamps and everything around. So I think I'm just going to let it do its thing and come back to this later. All right, we're coming at this box the next day after it's had a chance to dry. I've also used a box fan that I've had blowing into the front hole uh, to help speed that along a little since some of the thick areas that drain down the walls onto the floor of this cabinet uh, were taking kind of a while and I'm impatient. And so I want to talk through the next part that I'm going to do, which is using a hole saw, uh, which is one of these guys. This is a two inch. A uh, hole saw and it's sized to go to a speaker terminal like this to mount onto the back of the box. Uh, I'm gonna probably do it somewhere right in here. I've checked that against the inside to make sure that we're not gonna hit any of the braces or you know we're gonna be a safe distance from the wall. About a quarter of the way in toward the middle is good and this is actually how I'm gonna have it sit. That part there is gonna be the top, these are the sides. And this is the bottom and the setup that's going to be uh, good for my room actually is probably this corner so that when it's flipped around it'll be facing my stereo equipment where it's going to be wired to wanted to talk through this a little bit what i did on the back here now the duct tape looks a little ugly but here is my rationale being that this is plastic and is therefore going to be by far the weakest part of the structure compared to this wood I used a little quarter inch rubber weather stripping right here uh, in the hopes that some of the sound reverberation and whatnot in the box, this will help absorb some of that and not rattle the plastic. But I was having trouble getting both of these ends to stay on. So I went around it with duct tape to help secure that. And because when I measured uh, this cutout, it's gonna be, there's gonna be an ever so slight gap between this and the hole that that saw is gonna create. And so I'm also kind of hoping that the duct tape provides just a little bit of extra padding that's going to be ideal there. Uh, this is 12 gauge speaker wire clipped onto the inner clips with uh, wire clips made for 12 gauge wire and so we're just going to go I usually these are set banana clips also but I'm just going to pretty much go bare wire into the back of the box. Uh, I've pre-wired this so that after I drill the hole I can pretty much just drop this down in and apply the screws to bolt the sound of the box and then the wire is already run so I'm not reaching into the box because this is a pretty deep box uh, trying to mess with those wires. All right, as you can see, the whole drill is complete. My drill had kind of a tough time getting through here. This is some very dense wood, but as far as being a subwoofer box is concerned, that's great news. So now I'm gonna get ready to mount this terminal. As I explained earlier, the idea is that I can just feed this through here. And that way the wire is already run and 
like it needs to be. The duct tape was a good idea. That feels fairly snug as I push it down in. So hopefully we won't have air loss. If I do notice any air loss, what I might do is do a thin piece of weather stripping just around this part so that when I bolt it down, it really keeps that snug because in a sealed box, what we absolutely don't want is air leakage. Uh, that'll just ruin the seal for the woofer and sometimes can be audible. So pretty much where we're at now, I've, I've gone ahead off camera and sanded the corners too so that none of these edges are sharp. And anywhere where there were some imperfections where I didn't line things up 100% perfect on the seams here, uh, after the glue dried and, and formed a good seal so that we're in good shape there, I went over it with a circular sander and just made sure that that's all smooth. So. I am going to go ahead and play with this, screw that in, and then we'll move on to the next step. All right, we're at the point where we've mounted the speaker into the box and we're ready to screw it in. So I've already put two screws in, but I did want to talk through this quick. So as you see from the photos, it's nice that the outer front panel is kind of beveled in, but the tricky spot about that is, though it's flush with the woofer, that means if you ever need to take this out, it's gonna be kind of tricky. I don't know if there's a way to pry this out or you have to tip the box so the woofer kind of falls out in a controlled way. So that's something to think about if you are using the front panel. Uh, as far as putting the screws in, I'm just using one and a half inch wood screws. That's roughly the depth of the two front panels together so that we don't have a whole lot of screw protruding through, but it does take full advantage of the thickness that we have to hold this monster under control. And anytime I'm screwing in a woofer, I like to start at the top or the bottom and then go across just so that it's firmly held. Just a trick my dad taught me when I was younger instead of going this way and then this is loose on the other end. And then I pretty much replicate that the whole way across. I pick the other side. And We'll jump to that side. I am, in this case, using a star tip uh, instead of a Phillips head. Those tend to resist being stripped out a little better, uh, especially for when you're drilling them deep like this. I always go real slow at the start because I'm always very paranoid about putting the drill through the cone. I have done that once before when I was a teenager, so I always drill very, very carefully now to make sure that we're not doing that, especially since this doesn't have any metallic guard around the surround. It's so large, it's pretty much just bracing material and surround straight up. All right, so we have everything pre-wired in the box, everything sanded out on the outside. The speaker terminal is installed. I'll flip this around so that we can see that. So we are at this point ready to plug this in and Hear what it can do. All right, guys, this is what the Ultimax looks like in the completed box in the corner of my room. This proved, after extensive testing with other subwoofers, I've had to be the best place for it. So that was the first place I went to go here. As you can see, I still have a little sanding I can do on the top to get rid of some of that excess wood glue. And there are a couple areas up in here where it's not entirely level, where despite my best efforts lining things up and clamping, uh, there's a minor cosmetic kind of imperfection on some of the corners, but I have on very low base notes tested it. There's no air leakage, there's no rattle, there's no anything else. Uh, and that's true even of, as we go to the back of the box, you can see the speaker terminals that I mounted on the back. Um, I played some very low test notes and put my hand back here over it and I don't feel any air leakage around here and even leaning over it to listen to it, I don't hear any uh, sound escaping or unwanted hiss or anything like that from there. So definitely a first attempt on this box. I hope to do better the next time I'm playing with a DIY project like this, but all told, I don't think it came out bad. And in the future, I am going to sand this and I think stain it a little bit. But 
I'm sure you're really waiting at this point to hear about how did this monster sound. I'm gonna show some footage I got of test tones that I put through my phone, uh, starting at about 40 hertz and going down all the way to 20 and then to 15. I can't really hear anything, of course, at 15, and audibly I can barely hear anything at 20, but it does handle down to 25 really well. Okay, quick overview of the gear that I'm using. This is a Harman Kardon HK3490 receiver. It's kind of old, but it still works great and sounds great. I'm running that into two Klipsch RB61 bookshelf speakers. And then I'm powering the subwoofer with a Crown XLS1002 amp that's capable at four ohms of pushing about 1100 watts, which is perfect for this guy who wants 800. So I'm gonna go mount this up on here as we talk about it a little bit. I made myself some notes as I listened to this over the last four days, five days, because there's so much to say about this. First, I want to say, previously I was using car subs powered off of this Crown amp, but I was using the boxes that they came in uh, that are just basically prefab boxes meant for the trunk of a car, which as people mention in audio forums, the issue you run into there is they lose a lot of the really low end extension because they're counting on the trunk gain for those really low notes. And when you use it in your living room, uh, I didn't think I was getting that much of a problem before because I use test tones and, you know, could play audibly pretty well down to 25 hertz. So I was thinking all this time, oh, well, that's, you know, it's a myth. It's not a big deal. It sounds fine. And that was until I used this. And then I saw listening to music, watching movies, just how much more present the low end is. And to be honest, when I first looked at the specs of this, I saw the F3, which is the point at which the frequency curve starts to roll off at three decibels. And then from there, it continues to roll off. 12 decibels per octave, I saw that the F3 was 35 hertz, which at first didn't seem low enough. And I was kind of wondering like, well, how well is this Altimax going to handle the really low end? But that was until I used it and saw just how much better it handled the low end uh, than anything that I was using before. I'm sure uh, to be fair to the other speakers, a big part of that is look at the size of this box versus little prefab trunk boxes. But also, you can just move a lot of air with a 15. Um, and when you do the, ma the math on cone circumference, you do see that a 15 is in the ballpark of two 12s working together, and that has certainly been my experience. The solidarity of this box has made tracks like Angel by Massive Attack uh, sound very clean and very controlled, whereas on my other subs, that, that upper end bass that's really strong and prevalent in that song sounded a little sloppy, and you don't notice that at all with this. Obviously, I can't uh, play any of those songs for you in this video due to copyright reasons. Judas Priest's Painkiller. That's got a lot of quick double bass pedal action in it. Uh, people often cite songs that have that as an example of whether your sub is for sound quality or not, whether it can move quickly and tightly enough to capture that. I thought that song sounded great when I listened to it. It was punchy, it was tight, it was very controlled. There was no issue of where each of those hits started and stopped, no blurring together, no muddiness that you... Stereotypically, people talk about 15s as being big, heavy, and muddy, and I think you could say that this subwoofer is a great example of where that's old advice, it's not true anymore. You know, if the suspension and the engineering is good and the magnet is powerful enough to control everything, not true at all of a 15. 
There's no ringing or hangover sound on any of the bass notes, which is again a big improvement over what I noticed before. I had actually set my crossover a little lower at like the upper 60s and right around 71 hertz on that Crown amp before, because if I went all the way to 80 or 85, there was like a real resonance right around the 80 hertz mark that was very unpleasant, whereas I noticed you could cross it over a little higher and I did go up to 80 hertz again and didn't have any of that problem uh, with this one with that frequency. It just looks awesome. Every time I glance over at it from the couch, I'm like, look at that thing, the box, the cone, everything about it looks awesome. As I said, I can definitely notice the extended depth of the bass in songs, even songs like I was listening to Toto where the bass guitar and the drums definitely sound meatier before and those wouldn't necessarily be songs you would describe as having like powerful bass or anything, but man, does this make a difference on those songs. I think, I'd done some comparison videos before of the Infinity Kappa sub that I had versus the Kicker Comp VR sub uh, from back in the day. I had commented that the Kicker, what I liked about it was it had a lot more impact and punch to it uh, than the Infinity, but the Infinity was definitely more accurate. And my experience with this Ultimax is it kind of combines the best of both of those worlds, that it is a very accurate, tight sounding speaker that sounds awesome with all of the music that I've played on it of all genres, and we'll get into that in a minute, but it really has that shirt rattling impact uh, that I didn't feel like I was getting before. For kicks, if you have one of these, look up on YouTube the THX Ultimate Subwoofer Test track. I cranked the volume up uh, on day one of, of using this, and my wife was in the kitchen making a sandwich or something, and it shook the whole kitchen. Uh, from the living room. The counters, everything in there was vibrating. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. Uh, I've never heard that song sound like that. The bass sounded good and very powerful before, but it has never rattled that much of my house. So in the uh, marketing write-up they say about the Ultimax where they talk about foundation rattling bass, that's not just fluff. That's, that's some truth, guys. Uh, I imagine that would only be all the more so if you had the 18-inch version of this. In pretty much all the music that I listened to, whether it was rap, or if it was Pink Floyd, or Fleetwood Mac, or if it was modern rock, if it was heavy metal, the kick drum was much more present than before. I mean, it sounded decent with the subs that I was using, but man, it just really thumps. It really has a nice sound to it. Again, that extra depth that you get out of this box that I wasn't getting before. Uh, it may not go into the infrasonic range like some people in the forums talk about is great for movies and I could certainly see where if that's what you were after, that bass that you feel more than you can hear anymore, uh, a ported design might be better for this and if you tune that port low at like 20 hertz, 23 hertz, somewhere around there, it would probably pick up that really low end extension a lot better, but for my part, I probably 60-70% of the time I'm listening to music and like 30 to 40 percent of the time watching Netflix or Amazon TV shows, movies. You know, I certainly appreciate the deep rumble that this can do. I'm not like upset about the fact that it doesn't do the infrasonic bass a whole lot because to me in the audible range of what you can hear, this does an awesome job and it really brings out some depth to movies and music. Song you're probably all familiar with, Turn Down For What? If you haven't heard it in a while, suggest you look it up on YouTube. I used that song as my stress test before because every time I put that song on in moderate volume with my other subs, they were really, they seemed to be reaching the excursion max uh, pretty quickly on that song. It was just a very intense bass song. And even with two of them playing together, two of the 12s, to share the load, they were really moving. Now this thing definitely moved when I put that song on, but what's great about this sub with that gigantic surround that it has on it and it's high power handling is and no time in that song did I feel like oh man I'm getting close to you know it's a limit I'm probably straining it it never rattled it never sounded angry it never sounded like it was nearing what I could do I probably could have turned it up a lot more than I did I just didn't want the neighbors calling the police and trust me this thing gets that loud another song that sounded really good was sung by AWOL Nation called The Best it's a good song period, but there's some really powerful bass in that song too. And I wouldn't say that my old subwoofer is strained on that one as much as turned down for what, but definitely this one when I put that on was a more, if you were anywhere downstairs in my house, you were like, whoa, when that came on. It was very, very powerful, very full. 
All in all, I have to say I'm very happy with the sound of this sub. It takes me back to my childhood when I had some floor standing speakers with 15 inch woofers in them and it's just really nice to look at a woofer that big. I really think all that extra surface area goes a long way when it comes to giving you that full room filling, pant rattling bass that you just, I didn't anyway, get with 12. Uh, it really does make that much of a difference. This is a very well built sub. Uh, I've thrown a whole bunch of different movies at it. Um, the Matrix, a whole bunch of different action movies uh, over the weekend when I was trying this out and they've never sounded better and at no time did this sub sound mad or like it was straining itself or did I feel like I had to turn it down for any other reason than not to bother other people. Uh, so this is definitely a monster and it's always nice to have more sub than you need and in my experience with the size house that I have, I'm living in about a 1600 square foot house, a fairly open living room uh, design, and it's more sub than I would need. It's nice. I, I do have the gain set pretty high on uh, my crown amp, but that has more to do with the fact that these Klipsch bookshelves uh, have a 96 decibel efficiency rating, so I never really need to turn the receiver up all that high, and so I need the gains high on this so that it's sending enough signal. Uh, to this, but the nice thing about the indicator lights that you have on the crown amp is, you know, I know as soon as I say I set the gains all the way up, I hear people bristling saying, you're going to clip it, you're going to clip it, but you have the indicator lights, so you know how close you are to clipping, and I can tell you, you can go up three or four lights before clipping, I never go past the second light, and trust me, with this, by the time it's hitting the second of the indicator lights, it's loud. Uh, it's louder than I would ever need it. That gives me exactly the power that I need. I've never had any clipping. I've never had any distortion. I really appreciate the box design. Uh, I've never myself hand built a box since I was a teenager and that one was more guesswork. I didn't do nearly the research or the measurements that I should have. It sounded okay. I'm sure it would have sounded a heck of a lot better if I had actually measured it properly. Uh, so I can pretty much strike that from my mind and say I've never really built a proper box for a subwoofer. Uh, this is kind of a first. Obviously it's a little bit cheating because somebody else machined all of the parts, uh, did all the cutting for me. But I learned a lot definitely in the process of gluing this together and the setup and everything. And now uh, it is a plan of mine to get into cutting wood myself and, and designing all of that manually. Um, and. This is great because this box is, it's very dense wood, it's very heavy. It really gives you an idea without having to have quite all the tools that you would have to have in order to build this all yourself if you were doing the cutting. The denseness of the wood really shows you what a proper box can do. I've read in forums people say sometimes 70% of what you're hearing is the box and not the sub. I was a little skeptical about that until this box and definitely my impression with this is a solid box that doesn't rattle and properly contains the sound and more importantly is big enough to really let the sub breathe makes a huge difference in how good it sounds. And I have no doubt that while this is a very well built subwoofer, I have no doubt that a big part of why it sounds as good as it does is this box. Uh, for sure, if I had put it in a smaller or a thinner box, it would not have that sound at all. Uh, and for me, uh, just so that people know, of course, you, you do have to build a larger airspace in general when you're using a ported design. And as you can see, this box is already pretty big. I don't know necessarily. I mean, I do have some extra room in this corner for it, but I don't know how much bigger I would want to go. Definitely don't have room over here for an 18. And if I were you to use a bigger box for ported on this, it would have to be taller, definitely not wider, to accommodate the extra airspace. One piece of advice I'll definitely give anybody doing the build on this is, it's fine to build the box, of course, in your garage or workshop or wherever you're gonna do it. I brought the box in by itself first and set it on the living room floor, about there where the tripod is. And that is where I mounted the speaker into it, largely because I think this box is about 60 pounds. Uh, by itself once it's fully assembled. It's very dense wood and I think the subwoofer is like, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm thinking it's like 20 pounds or maybe 30, something like that. It's, it's fairly heavy. Uh, so by the time you mount it in the box, this box is hard to lift. I've picked it up to try to move it and position it a couple of times and it is heavy. So 
don't put yourself in a position where you fully mounted the speaker into it in your garage or something because it's going to be pretty heavy to carry all the way through your house. Um, put it wherever it's going to go, just a friendly heads up. I can't really think of any obvious cons to say about this speaker. I mean, it's, it's everything I was hoping it would be when it was sent to me. It's really more sub than I need. Uh, which is great. That's the problem to have rather than the other direction where you're always kind of hoping it could go a little bit louder. It handles the power of the output of this really well. And uh, if you followed my previous blog posts about projects I've worked on, uh, I feel a lot better about powering this off of the crown because I was using my uh, Infinity Kappa off of this at 8 ohm bridged, which this will do 700 watts into a speaker that was rated at 350. Now I never had an issue with it blowing because of course you're never running at it all the way up volume, but definitely it got that infinity moving and there were points, like I said, on songs like Turn Down For What and other stuff like that, that uh, I felt like I was really straining what the infinity was capable of and you were always a little scared to like turn the volume up past a certain point because you weren't sure what was gonna happen. My experience with this so far is I'm sure this would handle every bit of what that Crown amp could throw at it and you're limited in volume only by trying not to tick off your neighbors or your wife. I wouldn't feel it at all like when I was using this, I had to be like, whoops, turn that down because you're gonna like blow up the, the Ultimax or anything. This thing can take everything you throw at it. So that's awesome. And if you really felt like you needed more bass than that, adding a second one of these I think would be plenty to fill even a very large living room.